I went to my first coach, Mona, at the ripe age of 24, and I said, I want to be a coach because I was a personal trainer, and people were telling me, you know, you should be a coach or a counselor or something like that, or maybe I was, I lose track, somewhere in my 20s. She said, are you sure? And I said, yes, like you get to help people, and it's so exciting. And she's like, but your life will become your laboratory. You will not be able to bypass anything. You won't be able to suppress anything. You won't be able not to notice anything. Your life will be full of lessons. And I said, well, that doesn't sound so great. (laughs) And she said, but it actually is because you will evolve quicker. How many of you, since you decided to become a coach, has your own evolution sped up? Right, and at times, has it been more intense? Like, you're, you really understand that phrase, ignorance is bliss? I often say ignorance is bliss, success, awareness is a bitch, right? And then, and then you get all this awareness, but things aren't changing yet? Anybody in that phase at all? Like, and then imposter syndrome comes. Because you're like, wait a second, I'm not walking on water. I'm not there. I don't have it all figured out. How can I be a coach? Anybody go through that? Okay, so first thing, I already alluded to it, first thing that I, have, I feel makes anyone successful as a coach is being your own best client. So that means having a coach, not just a business coach, but a personal, I still have a coach. I will always have a coach because I think we are out of integrity as coaches if we don't have a coach. You'd never be a personal trainer and never work out. So if you want to beat imposter syndrome, that's the best way to do it. If you're ever feeling, who am I to, who am I to, who am I to, all you need to do is ask yourself, am I a client of what I'm selling? Because walking the talk doesn't mean having it all figured out. Walking the talk means you're just embodying the principles and practices that you're quote unquote selling to people. And I'm not afraid of the word selling. That word used to scare me, I'm not afraid of that anymore. Because really it is, it's it's an invitation. It's enrollment. And what you are, quote, unquote, selling to people is transformational, not transactional. And if I had a whole another hour with you, I'd give you a whole speech on selling and enrollment. We'll see if we get into any of it today. So it's being your own best client. It's having a coach. And here's how you also beat imposter syndrome. You coach yourself. Here's my favorite thing to do. Set up two chairs just right across from each other like this. Coach Christine sits here. Ask myself, what's up? Human client Christine sits here. And I literally go back and forth between chairs and coach myself. Coach over here, me over here. Because you all are brilliant. You all are brilliant at coaching others. But sometimes you kind of suck at coaching yourself. And the only reason you suck at coaching yourself is because you start judging yourself. That's it. And comparing yourself to coaches that have been coaching 20 years. So whenever you get into that, instead of, because a lot of the coaching on getting out of imposter syndrome is connect your why, and it's all about service, and you've got to change the world. But if that, self, that self-doubt needs proof. So how you give yourself proof, you set up two chairs, and you just you experience how you create transformation within yourself. Because when you do that on a regular basis, the imposter syndrome goes away, and the integrity floods in. So is everyone willing to do that as a tool? And don't do it in your head. It's very different. And don't do it in a journal. I mean, I'm not saying don't coach yourself in your head and never write. But this process right here is way more impactful. And guess what? That's a tool you can also facilitate for your clients. You can set up two chairs with them, have them coach themselves. You can set up two chairs and have them sit in one chair, their mother or whoever they're having a difficult relationship sit in the other, and have them play both parts. So... That's it, number one, be your own best client. Second thing, (laughs) stop talking and listen more. As coaches, we wanna do a good job. We so wanna do a good job. We wanna serve our clients. And often we think the best way to do this is to give them the answers. To have this great advice, to drop this great wisdom, and that's useful. And they may say, oh, that's great. Thank you so much. But then we're making it more about us and less about them. As a coach, I really consider myself a detective. I'm a detective and I'm a guide. And it's my job to, one, create a space where they feel safe. 
Because that's the most powerful thing we're doing as coaches, is to create a space where someone feels seen and heard. Our deepest wounds come from not feeling seen and heard. So please do not underestimate the power of just holding space for someone else and giving them that permission. It's one of the most powerful things we do. It's not what you say, it's your way of being with your clients. And that can be over the phone, that can be face to face, that can be over Skype, it doesn't matter. But to really hold that space for another person, we can't be in our head thinking, ooh, what NLP tool can I use right now? Or what do I say this? Or da 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 da. We have to be fully present with our clients. And this is something that develops over years as you coach more and more people. And I encourage you, coach, coach, coach. The best way to get better as a coach is to coach and to coach and to coach and to coach. That's how you get better. And really trust that the more you listen and the more you're present and the more you're with that other person, the, not the right thing to say, but the thing that's for the highest good to say will come through. And often the thing that's for the highest good to say is a question. Often the thing that's for the highest good to say is, what else? Tell me more. You don't know? Well, if you did know, what do you think? Not going off into some educational rant with them. Now, of course, as coaches, we guide. Of course, we teach. But we want to make sure we're guiding and teaching that which is for the highest good. So never make assumptions about what your client is telling you. I ask, I have a podcast where I coach people live on the air. Funny story about that that I want to weave in. I'll see if I can do it next. Um, and you'll hear me when people say, I want to feel confident. or I want, I'm like, what does confidence mean to you? Make no assumptions with your cli clients. And don't be afraid to go slow with them, to have them paint you a picture. When they say words, what do they mean? When they say, I want this, I want a relationship. OK, describe a relationship to me. What does that look like? And what would it do for if you had it? We, you have so much information as a coach, but when you're working with your clients, your detective, you're getting into their model of the world. And the more you can get into their model of the world, the more you can bring them the tools that they need. Because that's the other thing as coaches, we're not there to fish for them. It's my job with all my clients to graduate my clients. I want them to embody the tools and, and experience the transformation. And it's so much better when a client has the aha moment versus you telling them the aha moment. Because then it lands for them. Then it lands for them. The other thing that has inspired my success is I haven't given two shits. I don't have a logo. I don't have a color palette. I don't have a tagline. I don't have a strategy. I, none of those things. Do you know what my brand has been? Whatever is up for me in the moment, that's what I teach. Like whatever I've just walked through, that's what I teach. My brand started as the quarter life crisis and the 20 something journey. And it moved on from there. And then when I got divorced, I talked more about relationships. And when I was building my career, it was about entrepreneurism. It was just about what I was going through at the time. And I know I have an ideal client avatar. And I think in a way, I don't like to use the word should, but it's important. And here's the easiest way I think to do your ideal client avatar. Your ideal client avatar is you in the past. That's it. And here's the thing. Me in the past could be a 65-year-old man because it's more about the psychological profile of your client than where they live, their gender, how much money they make. My, usually my ideal client avatars are people that are hard on themselves, high achievers, they've dealt with an expectation hangover, something didn't go according to plan, they want to grow, they want to change, they want to dive deep into personal growth, and they're looking for a guide. And they want someone relatable and aspirational. Simple. So when you think about who is my client, you ask yourself, where was I five years ago? Where was I 10 years ago? Where was I a year ago? Where was I six months ago? Where am I right now? And when you speak to that, that's the magic of resonance, and that's the magic of the law of attraction. And that's the matter, magic of being able to bring clients to you without having to do Facebook ads and funnels. All those things are important, hasn't been my strategy. So in, in a conference like this, 
I think it's important to hear all the advice and go, what works for me? Like, what feels good to me? Because there, there are so many ways to grow, and you're going to find your own unique way.